multiple transplants and multiple sclerosis. If you have been following our work, I've shared lots of research showing that people diagnosed with multiple sclerosis have what is called dysbiosis, meaning that they are out of balance. They have far too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes in their, especially in the digestive tract. And so researchers understand this, and so they're wondering and investigating, could fecal transplants help patients, multiple sclerosis patients? Could fecal transplants be a potential new treatment for multiple sclerosis? If we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha, and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And I love to talk about this topic because I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis 35 years ago. And by the grace of God and a lot of work on my part, I learned early on that infections, parasites were causing the MS. And so now it, this whole field of parasites is really starting to explode now, and which is really exciting because finally the, the truth is starting to come out. And there's just a brand new study that just came out this month, August 2023, and the title of this study is called The Role of Fecal Microbiota Transplantation, so we're going to call it FMT, which is fecal transplants, in treating patients with multiple sclerosis. So this again was published just this month, August 2023, and I have talked about fecal transplants before, but it's a topic worth revisiting because there are so many nuggets that we can pull out of this as far as really helping us to understand what we need to do to recover from MS and not just multiple sclerosis, but other chronic diseases also. So what I'd like you to do is type your questions in the chat box. I will answer them later. And then if I can't get to all of them, my team will answer them for sure after, if you're listening to the replay also. So this study is looking at fecal transplants. And if you don't know what a fecal transplant is, it's when you take the feces or the poop from one person, and it should be a healthy donor. So the person that is is donating their poop and they should be a healthy person. We're gonna talk about what, it, like, I'll just mention it here, like if somebody is obese and they have used the fecal matter or the, so the microbes that are in the feces of somebody obese and you transplant that into another person, they have seen in studies that those people can become obese. So they're, these microbes really impact our health in many different ways. So it's very important that the donor is healthy and that the stool is tested and screened for different types of pathogens. But anyhow, you're taking the stool of a healthy person and they will filter it out. They'll take out the fiber and they're just looking for the liquid uh, that would contain a lot of different microbes that we don't even know what they are. And you take that liquid and you use an enema there's different procedures that the medical doctors can do, but basically they're just inserting that liquid feces from a healthy donor into somebody who's sick. And this is life-saving for some people. For people that are diagnosed with C. difficile, which is Clostridia difficile, if you've been following our work, I talk about some of the strains of Clostridia can produce really, really nasty toxins that make us sick. They're involved with multiple sclerosis, autism, and many other diseases, possibly ALS, etc. So this treatment, this fecal transplant or um, FMT procedure, that saves people's lives. And I've seen that it can be up to a 90% recovery rate for people that have this persistent Clostridia difficile bacteria that kills people. It actually was the cause of death of my father-in-law. And unfortunately, they were not able to offer this procedure to him. So the fecal transplant traditionally has been used more for people that have severe chronic diarrhea caused by the C. difficile bacteria. But um, different researchers and practitioners and clinicians have been also finding it super helpful for multiple sclerosis and also autism and probably many other conditions also. Before we move on to, let's remember that there is this highway of nerves between our gut and our brain. It's called the gut brain or the gut brain or the brain gut axis. And so whatever happens in the gut really impacts our brain, whether it's our 
uh, cognitive ability as far as our memory and our mood, foggy head, energy, all of that greatly is impacted. And even, you know, just as far as neurological function. So people are finding that when they're changing the microbes in their gut, they can walk better. <laughs> it's just crazy. So this is giving us really big clues as to where the research should be going. How, remember, I keep talking about how we need to have a different approach to researching neurological diseases like multiple sclerosis. So this fecal transplant, it can have different names. It, it can be called fecal transplantation. It can be called fecal microbiota transplantation, FMT. It can also be called stool transplant or intestinal microbial transplant. So those are just a few other, sorry, intestinal microbiota transplant. Those are just a few other names, all meaning the same thing. You're taking the feces, which is filtered, and taking it from a healthy person who has been screened and implanting it into the intestines of somebody who is sick. So this is again mainly used in the past for Clostridia difficile infections, which it has the potential to kill people. And it can be used for adults and children also. So what's fascinating is that there have been studies done where they take the fecal matter, so this is the microbiome that's in the feces of people that are alcoholics, and they would put them into sterile, they're called germ-free mice, so animal studies, and they find that those animals, the, the mice, are all of a sudden, they are really, really addicted and interested in alcohol. So our microbiome can also impact different cravings that we have, addictions that we have. I mentioned about obesity. There was one study that, and I, I'll have to look back, or hopefully I can find it and put it in the blog post, but where I was hearing that, that people received um, the, the feces, filtered feces, the, the transplant from people that were obese, and then they put on a whole bunch of weight also. So again, the microbes that live in our body really impact uh, our mood, like depression, anxiety, our mobility, but also the cravings we have. So like for obesity, it's just crazy. And depression too. So they can take the microbes from somebody who's really depressed and they can implant those microbes into, a, again, a sterile germ-free mouse to do mouse studies. And then that mouse or the mice that get the fecal matter or the transplant from a depressed person, they start to have depressive behaviors. This is a huge, huge, huge um, insight. These are really big insights. I hope you guys can see how the potential of this is so huge. So some of the highlights of this August 2023 study, again, they're talking about multiple sclerosis, how it is an immune-mediated me disease meaning that our immune system is involved. Our immune system is fighting something. Originally, they would say, well, it's your T cells. Your T cells have gone haywire. But then they're like, oh, your B cells also have gone haywire. And the microglia cells also. It's like, no, <laughs> our immune system, the job, the main job of our immune system is to fight parasites, to fight infections, to defend us from infections. So if all these immune cells are involved, if they're all activated, we need to start to look at which parasites are they trying to get rid of, which disease-causing microbes are present. So we know that multiple sclerosis, again, is the immune system is activated. We know that this disease definitely affects the central nervous system, but as you'll see with this fecal transplants, that when you change the microbes in the gut, it has incredible benefits for mobility, for just cognitive function, and it can last for years. I think that it was up to 15 years. Multiple sclerosis affects approximately 2.8 million people worldwide. So it's a big deal in Canada. It's one of the highest rates are in Canada. And so because studies have reported, again, on the disruption of the microbiome MMA in multiple sclerosis, that is what's really triggered researchers to go, well, you know, if the microbes are out of balance 
and we know that, let's say, for people that have C. difficile, their microbes are out of balance. I wonder if, if we gave them a fecal transplant, if it would make any difference to them. And so, of course, they do a lot of animal studies because it's more ethical than to just experiment on humans because they don't know if it's safe or not. So, but in animal studies, when they have given animals, though, again, like it's usually, well, it's not always sterile animals, but sometimes they have animals that, let's say, they gave a condition, EAV, EAE, which is the mouse model of, of multiple sclerosis. So they take these mice and they give them a toxin and they have a specific procedure to give them a neurological disease that's similar to multiple sclerosis and we call it EAE. So that's the animal model of MS. And then they like to test. The reality is, is it true for multiple sclerosis? Because just because you give a, an animal like a mouse or a rat a toxin that causes symptoms and lesions, then you think, well, maybe maybe there's a toxin that's causing RMS. So it's, it's ridiculous. But anyhow, so with the animal studies, they suggest that this fecal transplant from people with multiple sclerosis into healthy mice, so let's first talk about healthy mice, results in a microbiome. So results, so in that you take healthy mice and you take the fecal material, so the stool from and filtered from MS patients, you put it in healthy mice, and all of a sudden you see this huge increase in inflammation and um, EAE, so the experimental um, mouse model. So you see that, that the feces of MS patients, it gives huge neuroinflammation to healthy mice. And then if you take mice that have been caused to have this EAE MS-like disease and you give them healthy uh, fecal transplant from healthy donors, you notice a huge improvement in symptoms in those mice. So improved blood-brain barrier integrity, restoration of microbiota diversity, uh, less inflammation. So it really, really impacts the mice, whether you're taking healthy mice and you're giving them the fecal transplant from a MS patient or whether you're taking the diseased EAE mouse model and maybe giving them a healthy fecal transplant and then they're doing better. So there haven't been a lot of human studies done in this yet, which is really frustrating. So a few years ago, it looks like the FDA, because this is working so well with certain conditions like um, the fecal transplant is really, really helpful for the C. diff infections that are killing people, huge for autism and also for MS and probably many other conditions. So they have labeled the fecal transplant or FMT as a drug. So they want to regulate it, right? They want to control it. And unfortunately, that makes it a lot harder for practitioners to use it because now it's a drug and then there's always, depending on the country you're in, there's standard of care. You cannot just use any treatments that you want to. You usually have to follow, like with multiple sclerosis, you'd have to use disease-modifying drugs. You cannot use anything that's experimental. And before I continue, I do want to say too, though, that it is true that when you are getting the stool from, you think it's a healthy donor, but how do you really know it's a healthy donor? And that's, that is a dilemma, right? So they can test for certain things, but are they testing for all pathogens, right? So when you're in a situation where you're in a life or death situation, you're dealing with C. difficile infection, you know, you, you're just wasting away bloody stool, you're dying, then you're going to use something like this, right? And if it saves your life, wonderful. But if there are other options that where you don't have to risk, it's just like getting somebody's blood. If you don't have to get blood from another person or stool from another person or feces, then you would choose that for sure. Because there's even things like, you know, with the, the virus that's been going around over the last couple of years and the the, uh, I don't even want to say what it is, but what they're requiring everyone to have. So there can be things in our blood, there could be things in our stool that can impact our health ongoing. So those are things to really consider with doing. So I'm not saying that this is an end-all, be-all cure, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So although it looks promising, like really 
helpful, like more than the disease modifying drugs, they do want to make sure that they want to research this for years, right? They want to do randomized, comparable trials, and they want to do this over a long period of time, so it's not going to be a big help for those of us that have MS. Although there are things going on in the background, and I'll share that in a minute, they also want to, you know, look at, like, what would be the optimal dosage, like how many days, and what concentration should we be giving patients. But if it really helps people a lot, and they, it's way better than the, the disease-modifying drugs we have, if, you know, and this is where it's all based on benefit versus risk. If you're not really, really sick, then there are other options. If you're on death's door, then this can be incredibly helpful. So as far as the human trials, like there have been a few case studies. So these are more anecdotal, like not huge trials of people, but one of them was a 2011 case study trial where they had three different people that had multiple sclerosis and their findings were that the fecal transplant can reverse MS-like symptoms, suggesting that the GI infection is underpinning this disorder. So, and they really hope that this would, their findings would encourage a new direction in neurological research, right? So, and what I have seen is that the benefits can last for, you know, anywhere up to 15 years from when the study was done. So it's not like a short-term benefit. So the history of fecal transplants, the first fecal transplant type procedure was described. So it wasn't called fecal transplant, but it was described 1700, about 1700 years ago by a Chinese researcher. Oh, sorry, that was in the fourth century, I should say. That was in the fourth century. And it's, uh, I think it's G uh, Hong, G E and then H-O-N-G. So that was a Chinese researcher in the fourth century, and he gave this, they called it yellow soup, to treat his patients with severe diarrhea. So again, it wasn't called uh, FMT, it wasn't called fecal transplants, but he already knew that by giving the filtered, or they probably made it runny, it's like yellow peas, yellow soup, that it actually really helped patients um, recover. Then FMT was also widely used in the animal industry, and that was in the 17th century already. So the vets have been using this for a long time, and then the first fecal transplant in humans was 1958, where that was the first time that they have implemented this procedure in humans. I heard about fecal transplants years ago, and there's so many things that, that are helpful that have kind of been buried. And I think fecal transplants is probably one of them. I personally wouldn't do one. I'm not in a situation where I'm at death's door, but for my father-in-law, it could have probably saved his life. Dr. Perlmutter is amazing. So this is his book called Brain Maker. So his book, Brain Maker, and I've had that book for quite a few years. I got it when it first came out. And in that book, he talks about fecal transplants, and he talks about using fecal transplants or his experience in some of his patients choosing that therapy and what they experience. So the FDA does not, did not, at that time he wrote the book, did not allow physicians to use fecal transplants, so he could not you know, do that for his patients, but he could tell his patients about it, and then they could go to countries where they could have the procedure done. So there were other, you know, autism and other conditions, but I'll just talk about one that he talked about in the book. So there's one of his patients called Carlos. Um, when he saw Dr. Perlmutter, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He used a cane, and he had numbness and in both of his legs from the waist down and a decline in his balance. And so Dr. Perlmutter suggested that he should think about, first of all, doing probiotic enemas where you take filtered, sterilized water and you add a, a proper or safe type of probiotic blend and you add that to the water and then you do an enema with that. 
And so he started to do the probiotic enemas two to three times a week. And two weeks after, he noticed that, or do, he told or reported to Dr. Perlmutter that he was walking more, um, more comfortably and he was able to go, he had gone days without his cane. That's really huge, really, really huge. So his health was stabilized from just doing probiotic enemas. We've talked before, if you haven't seen my blog post on livediseasefree.com, I have done a post about probiotics and multiple sclerosis. There's definitely evidence that it helps. There's so many things pointing to our gut, right? So many things. So this is just more evidence. So then Dr. Perlmutter said, okay, so you're stabilized. You're still not really well, 100% well. Maybe you should look into the FMT, the fecal transplant procedure. And you'll have to go to a clinic in London because I can't help you in the United States. The FDA has controlled that. And so then one month after he returned from England, then he spoke with Dr. Perlmutter and he reported after his second treatment, the second fecal transplant treatment, he had a total of 10. But after the second one, he noted that his walking was dramatically improved and the improvements were persisting. And he told Dr. Perlmutter, I am walking so well that other people don't know that there's anything wrong with me. And in his book, Dr. Perlmutter stated that, it, that he had been practicing neurology for 30 years. So when he wrote the book, it had been 30 years of him practicing, practicing neurology. And he had never witnessed such remarkable improvements in his patients with multiple sclerosis as he observed with the use of fecal transplants, FMT. So again, he was not allowed to, to do that procedure, but he definitely coached his, his patients and they were, they were able to have to probably leave the country and it would be the same in Canada also. And so Dr. Perlmutter said, and he, this is a quote from his book, and now it's becoming apparently clear that what may prove to be the most powerful therapy for this disease is non-proprietary. No one can own it. Unfortunately, the FDA has called it a drug, so they sort of do own it. It's time for the world at large to be made aware that a different perspective of this disease of multiple sclerosis and other mysterious neurological conditions needs to be adopted and embraced. Wise words from a very wise, wise man. He is, I call him a hero doctor. So I have known about this for a long time. The interesting thing is that Carlos, who was in his book, he found that that at first the fecal transplants really helped him a lot. And, but then they would wear off after a few months and then he would have mobility issues again. So then he'd have to do another one and another one and another one. And he found that, that they weren't working as well as they did originally. So then he did join the Live Disease Free Plan. He, does, he joined, so that's Carlos in Dr. Perlmutter's book. He was my student. And so it's, you know, it could be helpful to re- introduce like diversity from a healthy donor, right? But he, you still want to also treat the parasites. So that's what he did in the Live Disease Free Plan. And the last that I heard from him years ago, because he was working with a functional medicine doctor in the States and he was treating parasites, he was walking. So, which was so awesome. And so that's, that is the sustained recovery is that, yes, you want to rebuild your microbiome, but you also want to treat the parasites because if you, let's say if you have larger worms, big and small worms, then they infect us with smaller parasites, bacteria and protists, et cetera. And so if you're just bringing in good bacteria to offset the bad, but then the big parasites keep infecting you with more and more bad, it's not sustainable. It's not going to be long lasting. And so that's why it is still very important to treat parasites very effectively before. But it really goes to show you like, like the types of microbes that are present in, our, in a healthy gut microbiome. We don't even know all of them. And they're so sensitive that if you were to you know, harvest the stool and, and start to study it, a lot of them die off right away. So this is another problem is that if you want to keep the diversity, the healthy diversity, a lot of them are sometimes they're they're sensitive to oxygen. They're sensitive to different environments. They're very living in a very sheltered 
area in the microbiome in your intestines. There's another website I wanted to share with you, and it's called thepowerofpoop.com. I just went to it now. Years and years ago, I went to it, and they had a lot of information out in the open, but now they have it behind. I think you have to get their newsletter, and then you can access their information because all of this information is so censored, but they're helpful, thepowerofpoop.com, if you want to learn more about it. Back in the day, they would have all kinds of information about how to find healthy donors, et cetera. Another couple of things, I'll go to your questions in a minute, but I wanted to share with you that in November 2022, the FDA approved the first fecal microbiota product, and this is called uh, R-E-B-Y-O-T-A, R-E-B-Y-O-T-A, uh, sorry, Rebiota, Rebiota, R-E-B-O, sorry, R-E-B-Y-O-T-A. And that is administered as a single dose. And so it is prepared from stool donated from qualified screened individuals. And the donors, they're tested, again, they're tested for all kinds of different pathogens, but I don't know if they catch all of them. And they have found, I wanted to go down to, uh, let's see, so they've done clinical trials. They've done two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials to look at the safety of this microbiota product, and the FDA feels that it's safe. And so those studies were conducted in the United States and in Canada, and the overall estimated rate of success in preventing uh, recurrent, and this is the Clostridia difficile infection. So that's really the only thing that it's allowed to be used for is that life-threatening infection. So in preventing recurrent, so if, if people are really struggling with this infection and they have this, take this microbiota product, then um, through eight weeks was significantly higher in the, sorry, preventing the reoccurrence of this bacteria, this Clostridia bacteria, uh, through eight weeks was significantly higher in the treated group versus the placebo group. So in... 70.6% of the group that was treated with the micro, microbiota product, so the FMT, it's like a, it was like a liquid, right? It would be like giving them, you'd have to be in a, in a hospital probably, and they would administer it like, like, I think they can do it like a colonoscopy, or they can do it like an enema. So to prevent recurrence of that horrible clostridia, it was like 70, almost 71% in the treated group versus only 57% in the group that got the placebo, so they did not get the fecal transplant. Then in April this year, 2023, the FDA approves the first oral administrated, administrated uh, fecal microbiota product for the prevention and reoccurrence of, again, C. diff, Clostridia difficile. So from going, so this is handier because then people don't have to go into the hospital and get this enema type thing. You can just swallow a pill. So it is a pill and it is available. So this is something that you can talk, if you're really, really sick, you can talk to your doctor about this. Maybe they can access it. Maybe it's only allowed to be used for C. diff. But that was in April, 2023. So it is coming. It's very, very controlled. I, I do appreciate us being careful because we definitely don't want to pick up other parasites because some of them are really awful. So this new pill form of the fecal transplant where you just swallowed is V-O-W-S-T. So VOST or VOST, V-O-W-S-T. And it was approved for the prevention of C. diff infections. Um, for 18 years and older, so not for children. And it's one, it's four capsules taken once a day orally for three consecutive days. It contains live bacteria. Is it going to contain all of the diversity from fresh stool from a healthy donor? I don't know, but maybe it will contain enough that it will really help C. diff. So it looks like it has been helpful for C. diff. So Looking down a little bit lower here, the effectiveness was evaluated again with a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial in which 89 participants received this 
treatment and 93 received a placebo. And through eight weeks after treatment, the reoccurrence of C. diff in the treated group was lower compared to the placebo control. So the reoccurrence of that horrible bacterial infection was 12% in the treated group and almost 40% in the untreated group. So it made a big difference in lowering the, the um, reoccurrence of that horrible clostridia. All right, so, so what I really pull from you know, learning about fecal transplants, what I have learned from all of this is that it really reinforces the significant effect of the microbiome in our gut it's not just the lesions, it's what's in our gut that really, really impacts our mobility. We have a lot of students that have become symptom-free and from multiple sclerosis, and they've been able to do that for years. They still might have lesions. The lesions are pockets of inflammation, they're pockets of infection, they shouldn't be there. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that is what's causing all of their neurological symptoms. Sometimes it's not. And if you treat well enough, people have been noticing that their lesions are healing over also. But there is so much that is in the gut that is impacting all of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So remember, there is this big ner highway, ner or highway of nerves between our gut and our brain. And so whatever's happening in our gut really impacts every aspect of our brain, whether it's communication of our brain with the rest of our body, whether it's our cognitive function, our memory, our mood, all of that, anxiety, like depression, all of that. And remember how mice that received the fecal transplant from a depressed person, the mice became depressed. And humans that received fecal transplant from an obese person, they became obese. And then mice, again, that received fecal matter from an alcoholic, they started to crave alcohol, and mice don't apparently crave alcohol. So there is a lot there. This is like a whole world. And we don't have to get overwhelmed by it. It's not like, it's like, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to get an answer? We have a plan, the live disease-free plan, and it works really well. We know that, again, through the research that I've shared, that with multiple sclerosis, we're dealing with dysbiosis, so we're out of balance. We have too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes. So what we have to do is we have to understand it's not going to be one pill and it's not going to be one microbe. The neat thing about the fecal transplant, it just shows you that there are certain microbes that are health-promoting, that they help us digest our food, they make vitamins for us, but they also can keep the bad guys under control. And so we definitely, as we're treating the worms, the protists, the bacteria, and the fungi, knocking them back, we do want to build back our natural defense. We want to build back diversity, and that is the key. The fecal transplant, it would kind of be a last resort for me because I just know that, like, even in my family, I don't honestly know anybody that I would want to, I would call them a healthy donor even children now like kids have so many health issues right they have allergies they have you know sinus issues they've got eczema they've got all kinds of things gut issues so they have a lot of parasites too unfortunately it's something that you know we're all out of balance right now but if you are on death's door it definitely can save your life so with a live disease free plan we stop feeding the infection, we follow the live disease-free diet, we decrease the food to the infection, we support the body by making sure we're having daily bowel movements, sleeping well, looking at our blood work, supporting our physiology, cleaning up things out of our environment, especially mold and radiation. And then we're feeling a lot better already. And then at that point, then we are energy tested to see which parasite treatments test best for us because we don't have good stool tests. There are different stool tests you can do. There's DNA tests, there's comprehensive stool analysis, but we have found that they just don't, they do not tell us what we're dealing with well enough to make a difference. So save your money there and then just put it towards treatments. So the energy testing, and so how do we figure out what, what um, and with the practitioners, how do they figure out what our treatment plan should be? It's based on our diagnosis, it's based on our symptoms. It's based on our health history and the health history of our parents. It's based on 
our energy test results, and it's also based on the experience that we've had working with hundreds of students from all over the world, what people are testing well for it with different types of diseases. So they're Although it's not always cookie cutter the same, there's a lot of patterns. You see that MS, they have a lot of roundworms. Big, big ones very often and very small ones all the way down to filarial worms that are in the central nervous system. We know that tapeworms are also often involved. Flukes can all, intestinal flukes and other flukes can be involved. We know that there's all kinds of pathogenic bacteria. I've shared lots of research on that. They're finding that's something that they have studied is more the bacteria, but again, there are hundreds if not thousands of different types of microbes and for them to figure all of this out it's going to take years and you don't have to wait for years there is a plan that works there is a plan that's proven and the nice thing is you can use treatments that will treat roundworms and so it will treat different types of roundworms you can use treatments that will take treat tapeworms different types of tapeworms different types of bacteria the herbs are really great for different types of bacteria for example and so we use oxygen therapies, we use herbs, and we use parasite drugs, helping them, our, our students to connect with doctors, get the support they need to build a, a game plan to treat. And it's giving people back their life. And I forgot to get all the successes from this week. I will share them next week. We had just a ton of successes come in. It's, for me, it's like Christmas. Every week, on, we have our Tuesday call for the wellness champions in the plan. And it's so much fun to hear from their hard work, what they are experiencing as far as life-changing symptom improvements. And then, yes, we do need to rebuild the good microbes. And I just, I just think that the fecal transplant is in its early stages, and I would just be really careful because if you infect yourself with certain parasites, then you've got other parasites to deal with. But again, if you're dealing with C. difficile and there's nothing else available, it can be up to a 90% remission rate, um, getting people into remission, which is amazing. You are so welcome, David. I'm going to see if you guys have any quick questions here. So how do you figure out what drugs you need? So it's through energy testing. And it took me a long time to accept this because it was kind of like I have a science degree and it's kind of like it's not an exact science, but it's really helpful. So every living thing has an energy field around it, and there are certain things that will affect our energy field. So it could be toxins, it could be infections, etc. So when you bring a remedy into the energy field, it will balance it or strengthen it, and they can pick that up through machines, an EA, EAV machine or a Vega machine or an AMA machine. They can also pick it up through advanced muscle testing like uh, applied kinesiology or ART testing, autonomic response testing. So there, there's different ways to, and you may have heard of muscle testing. So it's very, very subtle. And if you're working with a practitioner that's been doing it for years, they're a healthcare professional, they use it in their practice, they have a really good reputation, then we take like one dose of the commonly prescribed parasite drugs to the practitioner, it's nice if they're blind, if they don't know what they're testing, because you want them to not know that they should not care what they're testing. They're looking for changes in your energy. And so then you get a list from them. Yes, this one. No, not that one. Yes, this one. So then you have that list. And then our students bring that back to us and to their practitioner. And it's kind of like, yes, that makes sense. That is very common with, you know, with your condition, with what you're dealing with. So it's just... It's not very expensive and it's helpful. It's just another piece of the puzzle. So through all of that, again, health history, parents' health history, your diagnosis, your symptoms, because there are very specific symptoms for fungus, very specific symptoms like for mold or for yeast, for the Lyme infections, for Borrelia. So we've got a 14-page assessment form. And then also for like cerebral spinal nematodiasis, nematodes in the central nervous system, you know, nematodes in the gut, tapeworms, neurocystocercosis, which are the tapeworm larval cysts in the central nervous system, which is really common with multiple sclerosis also. So through all of that, it, you know, through the symptoms, it really helps us to kind of put all these pieces together and then treat. It's pretty common to have roundworms with not just MS, but other diseases, other neurological diseases even. Tapeworms is pretty common also. 
flukes more common than we realize. We don't really talk about flukes very much. And then of course, fungus is always overgrowth. And I've shared like in my masterclass training, the research, there's over a hundred years of evidence of studies linking MS to a Lyme spirochete type bacteria. And then also to a protist, like a Babesia malaria type protist. There's many, many years of research linking. So again, dysbiosis, but the nice thing is, is that you can, you can hit the bigger roundworms and protists, then you hit the fungus, and then you hit the smaller critters, and then you cycle back, and you just do a few treatment cycles. And when you're using the right treatments, you should start to notice symptom changes, improvements in four to five days. Not that you're cured, but you're like, okay, this is working. It could be a reduction in pain. It could be reduction in spasticity. It could be bladder improving. It could be cognitive function improving. It could be more strength. But you should start to notice it pretty quickly. But again, when we're so infested and we're so weak, we want to do the prep work first so that we're feeling a lot better before we start treating. That way we tolerate the treatments better. We can treat more quickly. All of that is so important because the parasite drugs are not a magic cure. The oxidizing agents are not a magic cure, and the herbs are definitely not a magic cure. But when you put all of these pieces together, it can really accelerate people's recovery and, and help them to have more recovery than they ever thought possible. We've seen this over and over again. Um, do people get better on the carnivore diet? So there are some students that just that find me, and they're on the carnivore diet, and if if that's you and you need to be on that because everything else makes you sick, then you can stay on it as you're getting ready to treat. But there are some people that, um, and to let you know that once you people start treating parasites and they can start introducing other foods again, it doesn't bother them anymore. But if somebody is just like, well, I just followed the carnivore diet because I just tried it and it seemed to be okay, but I really don't know if, you know, it bothers me to have a little bit of low-carb vegetables, they will introduce low-carb vegetables and they will notice that it, they're fine. So it's really up to you. Like, it really depends on the level of infestation a person's dealing with, the types of infections they're dealing with, and if they're, you know, if they're like, I can't eat greens, greens, G-R-E-E-N-S, like salads or, or any kind of low-carb vegetables, then stick with the carnivore diet. But it's not that vegetables are bad, it's that you're dealing with parasites. And when you treat the parasites, you can enjoy different foods again, but you gotta treat them well. We've noticed like, like one in particular student, she had been on the carnivore diet, didn't have MS, but just really, really sick. Everything she ate made her sick. And literally within three or four days of just using one roundworm medication, she was able to start introducing different types of foods again, and it, they didn't bother her anymore, which is crazy. So KF, you're following the diet, and you're now taking the parasite and fungal medications, uh, waiting for improvements. You're so very welcome. So it sounds like you're just starting on the treatment part. Patty, um, how long have you been doing this? I have been... So I was diagnosed with MS 35 years ago, and I was able to keep it in remission. I learned early on about candida, then Lyme, and all these different things. But catching it early is definitely helpful, but I was never able to treat parasites until I studied under these doctors, and then we helped our students do that, and man, what a difference that made for me also. So, but I have been, I need to sit down and actually look, but I think it's been about 10 years now around 10 years, because some of my students uh, from the first few large grouping, we have a large coaching program, the Live Disease Free Plan. And like Melissa, for example, she graded about 10 years ago. And she's been MS free for 10 years now. And uh, she started a health food company. So it's really exciting. We have students that have recovered starting. So she started a health food company, another Morella, she started a podcast. Another one, Sarah, you've seen her video or her success is Sarah Wilson. She's in a book, just launched this, this month with a bunch of other people that I've recovered. And um, another one, Lisa May, she has a, a wellness clinic in Ontario, Canada. She was a nurse, but she got booted because she didn't get the you know what. So she started a clinic. So now she's helping people, which is amazing, and corrected her infertility. She's having baby number three in a couple of months. And what else? There's a few other people. Another lady wrote a book. 
I think Daniela wanted to write a book. I'm trying to think who else. Oh, um, Vicky in the UK, she's got this wonderful yoga. Uh, she's a yoga, uh, call, <laughs> a yoga instructor. So she does that and she's super fit and strong. So there's all of these wellness champions like now for many years that have moved on with their life and they're doing things that they never thought they would do they're, when you get that second chance at life, it's like, I've always wanted to do this. And it's like, well, I'm going to do it now because I can. And that is so incredibly exciting. So I would say at least 10 years in a large group setting. I did coaching one-on-one -on -one for a little while, but I really love the dynamics of a larger group setting because you hear the successes of other students and it, it so motivates you and it gets you excited and it makes you implement better. And then you start having your successes that get shared with the other students and it pulls them up. So everyone's pulling each other up out of the pit of chronic disease. So Kim, you are, you're up in Ireland. That is really one o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can always listen to the replays. I encourage you to get your sleep, but it's so nice that you're here. Hello, Fawn. You feel so much better in every way, shape, and form. I'm so happy. So if we, when we're treating, we notice huge symptom improvements and we have to keep treating until we have treated well enough. And that is, I think that that is one of the biggest things is that we really didn't know how infested we were until we started seeing what was coming out. We're using the oxidizing enemas. You can learn more about that on our website. You can just type it, um, go to live disease free oxidizing enemas for treating parasites and you'll find that blog post. And uh, that oxygen therapy has really, really helped us to see what we're dealing with. Awesome, hello Jill. Have you heard of this before? Oh, or, hmm, sorry. Let's see, Patty. I don't know what your question was there, Jill. If you have another question, just go ahead and type it in the question box. Patty. Are you seeing any improvements? Oh, sorry, you're, you're chatting with each other. All right. I see if there's any questions. I see there's a lot of conversations going on here. So, so I it's P A M E. So you're already on our list. And how do I get to have a one-on-one -on -one with you? So just email us. Just go to livediseasefree.com and type in the chat box there. There's a chat box on our website. If you have any questions, go ahead and type in there and just say, I'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one with Pam. Um, so then you'll just fill out a form. Caroline or Marissa will send you the form. You fill that out, and then you'll get a link to my calendar. And let's see here. People like you are real healthcare professionals. You know, Sam, the thing is that Dr. Um, Hyman, he shared a really profound statement. He said, people that were our healthcare professional, professionals, so the healthcare system that we had before, it was more like disease maintenance. And that's really, unfortunately, our healthcare system has really become disease maintenance, where we are allowing people to live with chronic disease. And now we are shifting away from managing sickness and we are creating health. And it's so simple, right? eat right, get nutrition, exercise, get some sunshine, manage your stress, all of those things we know. But where, they, where he, we have been fooled is we have been fooled into thinking that our immune system is the problem and our immune system is not the problem. The microbes that live in our body are out of balance. And when you restore balance to that, and it makes perfect sense, right? Because when you're when your dogs have parasites or your horses or your cats, they're sick, right? And you deworm them. And that's the same with humans. So everything points to our microbiome is out of balance. And then as we, and this, what I shared with you today really solidifies that, right? It, it really helps to add a lot of credibility to that. Again, I'm not advocating fecal transplants, but I'm just saying that 
it's in the gut. The biggest part is in the gut. And if you can get that corrected, it changes your entire life. So if you're at, there's more questions, you go ahead and keep them coming in. I will answer them. Our team will answer them. But if you're at the place where you are like, I had no idea. Like I've had sickness for so many years, not just MS, other disease. I've had it for so many years and no one's ever told me that it could be parasites. Then watch some of my masterclass, watch my masterclass training. You'll find that on beside this video, above it, below it. And you'll find it on our website also. And you can watch a bunch of videos that I have on YouTube and on Facebook. Our blog post on livediseasefree.com is really good because the videos are shorter. It's written out in text. You can go to different links if you want to look at studies and, and go onto different blog posts. I've covered so many topics that really help you to give you clarity on what you're dealing with, why you're sick, why you can't get well with the disease-modifying drugs, why you can't get well with exercise and just diet and also supplements. You've got to treat the parasites. And then when you're at the place where you're like, okay, I got it. I know I'm dealing with parasites and I want support. I don't have a practitioner. I don't know how to treat these parasites. If you need help, reach out to us. Watch my masterclass training. You will learn all the steps that we take in the Live Disease Free Plan to recover. And then if you want my support, you'll have an opportunity to fill out a form and book a time and chat with me. You can become a wellness champion this week if you like. We have people joining every week from all over the world. So we can support you from anywhere. Just know we've had students in India and the Caribbean and Greece and Kuwait, uh, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, Italy, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, all over the place. So just know that we can support you. We have a proven plan, a proven system, and you don't have to suffer. You don't have to live with this. So if you enjoy this research that I'm sharing with you, the hours that I'm putting in, please like, share, and subscribe, and just get the, help us to get the word out, because I can't do this by myself. I need help. And for those of you that are listening, and if you're a healthcare professional, maybe you have a PhD in medicine, or maybe you have a PhD in physiotherapy or nursing or whatever, or a master's, maybe you have background in research. And if you love this kind of information, and if you want to help us, we are, I'm starting to gather some different professionals. We're going to make a, a team of people. We are going to start to move forward with this research. I can't do it by myself, but if we have enough people, um, we're going to use, the, it's called the MSIDI, which is the Multiple Sclerosis Infectious Disease Initiative. We've already got a few people interested in supporting us with this research. I've got a lab in mind that, that could potentially help us to figure out some testing that would actually be meaningful for us. So if you are in that position, reach out to info at livediseasefree.com and let me know, especially if you have been a wellness champion. We've had a lot of professional people take the Live Disease Free plan because then you know this plan, you understand, you understand the parasites. Um, you would be a really great help to helping us to change the way that not just MS but other chronic diseases treated. So I hope you have a wonderful week and I will be back next week. Take care. Bye-bye for now.